Um, I want to lead by saying that I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so feel free to disagree with any of this. Um, if you disagree with this, I want to talk to you and have a conversation. The more you disagree with me, the more likely it is we're going to have an interesting conversation. Um, so I'm a child of the 90s. And as a kid in the 90s, I grew up, I feel like I was the first generation on social networking, back when social networking was social networking. Hey, well. <laughs> yep. And uh, as a kid in the 90s, I also feel like I was the last generation on social networking. Because um, in my opinion, social networking, is, it, it died. I feel like we all missed the funeral and it got replaced by this thing called social media. And social networking, the promise of it was that it was supposed to connect us. It was a place to build community. It was a place where we could go in both our like local communities. Our cities would organize there, our neighborhoods would organize there, our schools and our businesses would organize there. It was a place to connect us with our community. But also it was a global community. We would be able to self-organize around shared interests. We would be able to self-organize around knowledge, passions, hobbies, and those global communities that bridge geopolitical borders. They would give us an opportunity to connect with people that we normally wouldn't be able to connect with and build empathy for one another by focusing on what we had in common instead of what, we, like, what our differences were. And I feel like the early days of social networking delivered on this, right? In the 90s, or well, in the 2000s, the early, early social networks, I think that's what they did. But at some point, this idea of community building gave way to social media. And social media looks more like a variable rate reward system that takes randos on the internet and hypes them up in front of other randos on the internet to try to make them famous. And uh, when we look out at the landscape of social media, um, while social networking connected us, I feel like social media, it isolates us. You go out into our communities and people never have felt so alone in my lifetime. People have never felt so divided in our lifetime. I go to my like, school district and they talk about the sessions they have for parents where they talk about kids growing up on social media. And in those same exact sessions, they're talking about like the suicide epidemic hitting our kids. Our children have body image issues. They aren't like social media, in my opinion, where we're at as a society is not okay. And this hits hard because I have two kids, two very young kids. And if I'm lucky, I have about 10 years, 10 years until I have to worry about them and the social media statistics that we see our school districts talking to us about. So, how did this happen? Well, if you're upset with social media and the way it is, and you're nostalgic for social networking, right? And you set out to try to build a social networking website, I'm going to assert, it is my belief, that if you go out and try to build a social networking website today on the internet, one of two things is gonna happen. First, your business is gonna go under, you're gonna go bankrupt. Or, you're gonna wake up 10 years from now and you're gonna find that you have accidentally built a social media company. I believe social media is the game theory local optimum on the internet, given the game mechanics for the social networking experience. The people who've built social media, they started building social networks, and I believe they had good intentions. The problem with social networks is the internet. The internet is designed to connect computers. And if we're being honest, it kind of does a shit job of that. Um, I don't know about you, every experience I've had that's social with computers I haven't cared about the computer on the other end of the connection. When I talk about social interactions, we say things like, I'm gonna send you an email. I don't say I'm gonna send your computer an email. I'm not gonna send your server an email. I wanna send you an email. And the internet doesn't address people. There's no way to get a handle to a person on the internet, right? On top of that, the internet's supposed to connect computers, but it's actually really hard for me to find a reliable route from my laptop at home or my cell phone here to my computer at home, or from my computer at home to my The web is doing just fine. You can spin up a website on your home computer just fine. You can design that, we can pave that road for normal users, and that is super easy. Like That was what Microsoft Front Page did. The problem is when you publish that on your local computer, there's really no way for your friends to reliably find a path to that website that's being hosted on your laptop, right? On top of that, computers shut off. And there's an availability problem. You want your computer to always be online if you're hosting a website on it or if you're hosting your social media posts on it, right? So when people set out to build social networks back in the 2000s, they did a very rational thing. They took a server, they shoved it into a server rack, 
and instead of us trying to find paths over the open internet from my computer to their computer, we all rendezvoused at some data center in Virginia because it was a lot easier to find the data center in Virginia than it was for me to find my friend's computer on the internet. And this worked really well at first, and we had the like, promise of social networking. We all started building communities there, right? And it worked really well, and it ended up being a global community. And these servers found themselves sitting in a place where they were acting as the free archivist, proxy, and relay for the entire world's social communication. And it turns out that this was a hard problem to solve. It's a hard engineering problem to solve, but being in this industry long enough, I feel like I can say the engineering part was the easy part. Right? It was a hard financial problem to solve. It was a hard legal problem to solve. And it was a hard moral and ethical problem to solve. Because when everybody is sending all of their private thoughts, all of their posts, all of their videos, all of their communication is going through your server, a lot of people are going to have opinions about what other people say and what other people do. And you are personally going to feel morally conflicted about what some of your users do on your server. So instead of solving these problems as these networks grew, I feel like social networking companies pivoted and they pivoted from community building into the hype machines we see today. And if we try to build a social network on the internet today, I suspect we will fall prey to the same exact thing. So how can we bring back social networks? I just said it's not possible. And I think the solution is that we don't need Web3. Everybody talks about Web3. The web is just fine. We don't need a new version of the web. What we need is a new internet. And that's a bold claim, but we're going to do it today. <laughs> Specifically, what we need is we need a way to make humans, their content and their devices addressable in a meaningful way on the internet. Right? We need a way to do that that allows us to express our equity in that data. We'll get back to what that word equity means in a minute, but first we're going to talk about making things addressable. So this is Louis. Louis has a handle. He's addressable on the internet. He's addressable in many different places on the internet. This is one of them. This is how you address Louis on X. The problem with this is it requires a central server. In order for me to find Louis, I have to go into X and plug this in to find his zeets. It works really well to find his zeets, but uh, not necessarily for me to find any other content on the internet or his devices. So before we set off on this journey, I want to call out a trap that I think most of the Web3 ecosystem has fallen into. I call it the king problem. The king problem states, that there is no sufficient level of evidence necessary for you to be king. It doesn't matter if you have like meticulously documented family history that shows that you are in fact heir to the throne. It doesn't matter if you have cryptographic proof signed by the literal gods of your ancestors declaring you sovereign over this region. What matters is that people believe you are king. Kings who have forgotten this un or inconvenient truth generally didn't fare well in history. And, uh, Trying to explain this and what it means for social networks. I think Spoon Boy says it best in The Matrix, right? Do not try to bend the spoon, that is impossible. Only try to realize the truth. There is no spoon. Then you'll see it is not the spoon that bends, it's only yourself. The spoon isn't real. In The Matrix, the spoon's not real. The spoon is a construct. It's a construct that exists because you believe it exists. Identity is a construct in society. We don't actually know who other people in society are. We have reasonable levels of evidence that support the belief in those people. And it's not just people, it's everything. Our institutions are constructs. Our governments exist because we believe in them. Our communities exist because we believe in them. Our clubs at school, they exist because we believe in them. And much like Santa Claus, when you stop believing in them, they stop existing. So what can this do? for us. And is this just pedantic? It kind of sounds like it's pedantic. But what this means is we don't need universal consensus for identity, right? And there's a lot of projects that are trying to find universal consensus for proof of personhood. They literally distribute these weird looking orbs in the third world that scan your eyeballs and try to print cryptographic wallets for you to prove your personhood. And I think that that is probably not the path forward. And I propose this concept of fiat identity. And I think once we start thinking about identity as fiat, as this thing that exists because we believe in it, peer-to-peer -peer systems start getting a lot easier to build. So really what we want is not some global identifier. We just need some identifier that we can look up in an address book 
and we get back something that I reasonably believe represents Louis. You told me I could use you in this presentation. I don't think you realized how much you're gonna hear your name today, man. <laughs> so there's some requirements for this identity before we get going. Right? First is it needs to be globally unique. If two people on the internet, if we're gonna address two people on the internet and they have the same identifier, it's not a very good identifier. The other is it needs to be provable. Like for example, a MAC address. If you have a MAC address on the internet, other computers can lie about what their MAC address is. And if you don't have a way of proving what that identity is, right, somebody's gonna lie to you about who they are. And this is where public-private key cryptography comes in. Public-private key cryptography works just like standard locks and keys. You have a key, it can lock a box. But these keys are a little different than real keys. When you lock a box with one key, there's another key in the key pair that can unlock that box. So if you lock a key with one of the keys, only the other key can unlock the box. So we're going to use one of those keys and we're gonna call it our public key. We're gonna give it to everybody. The other key, we're gonna keep it to ourselves. And that is gonna be our proof. I have some secret that I possess that you can reasonably believe only I possess, or somebody has stolen it, right? That proves that I am in possession of this identity. And we are going to use that public key as an identifier. The next challenge is we have an identifier now that we can say, hey, my name is public key. We need to associate that with content. Right? I need to go from, I have this public key, I wanna see all of the recent blog posts or social networking posts from this key. And this is where blockchain comes in. Bear with me, I know, blockchain. <laughs> Wait. So the first block is what we're gonna call our genesis block. We take our public key, we put it inside that block. Right? We hash the public key. There's no previous block because this is the genesis block. So we have that set as, set as nil. Right? And then we sign the public key with the private key. What's interesting about this block is it's self-evident. By looking at this block, I know there is a public key and I know the person who generated it has control of the private key because the signature is right there. I can then take the blog post that I wanna publish and I can put it as the second block. And I sign its content with the private key. And its hash is hashed with the previous key. What that means is if you change anything in the blocks before it, the hash of this block is gonna change. So things are ordered, and once I have some established history with you, I know if you're trying to rewrite your history. I can detect that because the hashes are gonna change. You can't lie to me about the things you've done on this network. But now we have a problem. Oh, blockchains, right. So what's interesting about this is if you notice, there was no global consensus. We have no proof of work scheme. The only proof in this blockchain is that you are in possession of the keys doing the signing. What that means is everybody can get their own blockchain. Literally, when you join a network with this identity, you manifest it out of nothing, and the only proof you have that this belongs to your identity is that somebody else reasonably believes that you have proof of your pri like possession of a private key. It means everybody gets their own identity on the network. Everybody gets their own blockchain on the network. It's a network of tiny blockchains. What's that? Merkle DAGs. Merkle DAGs, yes. Oh, you're a few steps ahead of me, man. So now we've got a problem. And he's got the solution. Um, Louis has multiple devices. He doesn't just have one device. And we only have one private key right now. How does his multiple devices sign a blockchain prove that he is in fact who he is, right? And what we're gonna do to solve this is we're gonna temporarily take away Louis' identity. Don't worry, he will get it back. And instead of sending a private key and sharing a single private key across all the devices, which will cause race conditions if they can't coordinate with one another. They'll both try to generate the next block. And if you both generate the next block, right, you now no longer have a blockchain. You have a syncing issue, right? You can't synchronize those chains. We're instead gonna give a private key to each device. And these keys all look the same. They are different keys. And this is where, up until now, I just pitched to you secure Scuttlebutt. That, that system exists. You can get on a social network today that uses that. This is where things change. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that initial key, we're gonna put it in the blockchain just like before, but that's gonna be the browser's key. It's gonna do its blog post, and next the laptop is gonna pair with the browser. Maybe Louis has got like his Postgres database or something running in a browser tab, he wants to host his social network node on it, right? <clears throat> we're gonna take this key, and we're going to sign this public key with the private key from the browser. And what that's saying is the browser is saying, I delegate the right to generate blocks for this blockchain 
to this new device's key. So now both keys can generate blocks for this blockchain. This solves half of it. We're no longer sending private keys across the network, which you usually don't want to do, right? Um, but we still have a problem. The laptop can sign this block now, and the browser can sign this block, so they can both generate a new blog post. But we now have a syncing issue. You can't sync this chain. And the solution is actually pretty trivial. We allow the chain to fork. And we take a block chain and we turn it into a block tree. And instead of recognizing or addressing the block chain with its sequence number, we address the nodes in the block tree with the key that was used to sign the node and the sequence number. So the first node is now browser sequence zero. And these last nodes here, the laptop sequence three and browser sequence three are both valid entries in this block tree. And they're all addressable. And this is where we give Louis his identity back. Louis' identity is now the tree. If I can find the tree, I can now find the devices and I can find the content, which is all we need to do. This is what we set out to do. We now have identifiers for content on the network. And like I said, identity is fiat. You don't necessarily have to have one tree. I can refer to a collection of trees and these trees can represent somebody that I refer to as Louis. And I don't need global consensus on this. If I was going to send Louis a message, I just need to know that Louis is Louis and that I am me. And Louis needs to know that too. And we have to know that we sent each other a message. And I don't really care if some guy in Croatia agrees with whether or not that message was sent. We don't need a global blockchain. So now we have identifiers for humans, content, and devices. And this is only half the story. We now need to make these routable and discoverable. What does that mean? Routable means I can establish a connection to the device. If I have a public key, regardless of where this device is in the world, right? It could be moving. It could be in a vehicle driving down the highway. I want to be able to net dot dial that public key, just like I can TCP dot dial 192.168.1.14000 and get a connection to the machine on the other end of that IP address. I want to get a reliable connection to this public key to make something discoverable. I want to be able to say, hey, I have this tree and the sequence number. Give me back the block that belongs to it. If I can do these two things, if I can find the public keys, connect to computers, and I can address trees, and I can get the blocks, I can reconstruct an entire tree from anywhere on the network doing with just like these two primitives, right? So how do we do that? Well, we need to take these identifiers and we need to put them in that address book I was talking about. We need some sort of global address book that is real time that I can look up. And when IP addresses change, when you switch from the IP network to Bluetooth or WebSockets, it can encode the information for the path I need to follow from my device to get to the other device. And what we're going to use for this is something, I, I don't know if it's well known outside of peer-to-peer -peer networks, it's called a DHT. And we're going to go through how a DHT works. Well, we're not going to talk about the DHT itself and how it works. We don't have time for that today, but we're going to model the mental model for how you can use a DHT. So when you connect to the internet, you get a set of IP addresses. You don't just get one, you get a set of IP addresses. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this set of IP addresses and we're going to associate it with that public key I was talking about. And we're going to do that by taking, oh, went backwards, taking the public key and the addresses and putting it in what's called a DHT, which is a distributed hash table. I can put key value pairs in them and later on get the key value pairs back out. Um, the DHT has nice scaling properties. It scales O in log in with the size of the network. So you can have a, a massive network and this key value store will should stay resilient to it. Later on, when I want to find this computer, I go back to the DHT and I give it that public key and the DHT will give me the addresses for that computer. I can then use those addresses using the standard internet to connect to that device. So now we have a way of making computers discoverable with their public key. We now need a way of discovering files. And we're talking about files, but files are just arrays of bytes. You can put block the blocks earlier. If you encode them in an array of bytes, you can find them using file discovery. If you can take a reference to the tree, and encode it as an array of bytes, you should be able to discover it using file discovery. 
So let's say we have multiple computers, they all possess a file. And I want to find all of the computers on the network that have that file. Well, I need a unique identifier for a file, just like I needed a unique identifier for people. And what we're going to use here is a SHA-256 hash. And this is nice because it's provable. If I ask for you using a, a file from you using the SHA-256 hash, I'm like, hey, here's a file I'm looking for. Give me this file. You send me this array of bytes. I can hash that array of bytes, compare it to the SHA-256 hash I asked for, and if it matches, I know you didn't lie to me. I know that was the file I was looking for. If it doesn't match, I stop talking to you. So we take that SHA-256 hash and the public key that claims to ha have it, we put it also, we also use the DHT. We just plug it into the DHT. Later on, when I want to find a file, I go to the DHT and I'm like, yo, tell me all of the computers that have claimed to have this file. Give me their public keys. It'll return the list of public keys in case, in this case, there are three, three computers claim to have this file. And then I send those three keys back to the DHT to get the IP addresses back. Now I have the list of all the real computers, real world that claim to have this file. I can reach out to them, download the file, hash it, make sure it matches the hash I was looking for. And we've now discovered a file on the internet. Now you might be saying, yo, we just used the internet to do this. And we said the internet is broken. What this is is an overlay network. If you remember the early days of the internet, the internet was built as an overlay network on top of the telephony system, right? We use telephones for the early internet. At some point, the internet became so successful that the telephone system is now an overlay network on top of the internet. Right? This is an overlay network on top of the internet. We've taken what is now a broken internet that can't connect devices, and we've allowed us to publish the paths to those devices to a DHT that resolves them to the broken network in a dynamic way. So we can discover devices regardless of where they are. We can then take a SHA-256 hash go to the address book and get back the list of all of the computers that have the content represented by that hash, regardless of whether it's a tree or a blog post. So we set out at the beginning of this to do two things. The first, we needed to make humans the content or their content and their devices addressable for the, uh, for the web. And while that sounded like a really big task and there was a lot of really like big and scary things at the beginning, this data structure is not that complicated. It's like a super simple chain of hashes, right? Um, it doesn't take too long to implement and DHTs are really well established. You can spin up your own DHT today in about 10 minutes using libp2p, right? Um, this isn't super complicated to build. It's just taken us a while to figure out and build all the systems necessary to plug them together. And over the last 10 years, they've matured enough where we can now do these kinds of things. And that's really cool. The next thing that we need is a way of expressing equity in that data. And hear me out. This is, this is out there. So when I talk about equity, I'm sp talking specifically about property law. And property law is a really weird thing to talk about in the context of a peer-to-peer -peer social network. So what is equity? Equity is an ownership interest in property. Right? So if you have equity in something, you own it. And property law is a system of rights that give people legal control of valuable things. So why are we talking about property law with social media? and social networking. I'm going to assert that in the context of social networking, when we talk about what companies do with our data, privacy is roughly within a margin of error equivalent to equity. And what do I mean by that? Part of how social media companies pay their bills is that they accumulate equity in their users' data. They own that data. And then they monetize that data, right? And if we remember right, or if we remember equity, is an ownership stake in property, and property is the legal right to control something. That equity gives them control over your data. They own that data. That's how sh the whole data broker shadow market works. You don't own that data. They can turn around and sell it to anybody without your consent. And you might ask yourself, well, we're connecting to these computers. We're sharing all of this information. I have my shopper's card, the gas station, and the grocery store. They're able to see all of this behavior. What stops them from selling it? And we all intuitively understand that access is not equivalent to rights, right? And like most of society, we understand this, but when it comes to our personal data, we've somehow forgotten this rule. The difference between access and rights, when it comes to a vehicle, access is Grand Theft Auto, and rights is owning the car. When it comes to a home, access is trespassing, rights is you know, home ownership, which we should, right? When it comes to access, 
to movies. We've seen this play out for intellectual property. Access is the pirate bay. Rights is Netflix. And we all intuitively understand that just because Netflix sends a video file to my computer doesn't mean I can take that video file and sell it to my friend. But for some reason, when I access Netflix's servers and they can view all of my viewing habits, that's totally fair game for them to take that information and sell it to a data broker or to Warner Brothers. I don't know. I probably shouldn't use them as an example, um, but uh, I just did. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, somehow we've lost all equity in this data. And the data broker market really looks a lot more like the pirate bay once you bring equity into the story, right? And I'm going to assert that for privacy, when it comes to sharing our information on the internet, equity is way more important than access controls. We've had like an entire like civilization worth of experience here, like just rental cars. Access wasn't perfect. They locked their cars, yes, but at some point when you went to rent a vehicle, they handed you the keys and they just had faith that you were going to bring that car back and they didn't necessarily have a perfect cryptographic system to make sure that you got that car back, but they had equity. They owned that car. And if you didn't bring the car back, well, that's Grand Theft Auto and they had other ways of solving that problem. They didn't need perfect keys and perfect control over the vehicle to get their cars back. And the system worked mostly fine. Some cars disappeared, most came back. So for social networks, I'm going to assert and for peer-to-peer -peer networks in general, that equity is far more important than perfect cryptography. If you don't get your equity right up front, no amount of cryptography is going to make up for that. But if you get your equity right up front, and somebody cryptographically correctly steals all of the money out of your wallet, the equity in that money is far more important than the cryptography was. You can use the equity to get the money back, even if they you know, followed the rules of the cryptographic system. So if we want equity in peer-to-peer -peer systems, we need a handful of things. Two of them we already have. We have addressable content. We need to be able to say what the property is, right? That's the content. And we need a way to say who has equity in it. That's the humans. But we also need legal contracts. We need people to be able to enter into legal agreements on the network to transfer property, to give access to property, to have a rental agreement for a vehicle. And then only once we have the equity, the legal agreements that are recognized by you know, the people we want to enforce equity, only at that point do we care about cryptography. We need to work backwards from equity to cryptography, not start with cryptography and move towards equity. And this is where I think some of the peer-to-peer -peer space may not have gotten it right. Because governments have been governmenting for a very long time, and they have a long history of you know, representing property law. And very few governments are set up to recognize this as a legal contract. And yet, that is what a lot of blockchains tried to do. What governments are set up to understand looks a lot like this. Sign on the dotted line. Here's a document with the clear terms, legal terms that we already recognize that says what the contract you're entering into, what is the equity that you have, and whatever is happening. So when you take some image and you take the hash of it and you throw it on a blockchain and you start buying and selling that hash, right? That's most people say what I'm talking about NFTs immediately. I feel a little bit of a problem with NFTs because very few governments actually recognize this transaction. And when you buy your NFTs, most of the time you're going through a centralized marketplace where you agree to terms of services. There's a reason why most marketplaces look like eBay. And it's because you have to sign a text document in order to buy and sell the NFT because the NFT itself isn't endowed with any property rights. You've bought a hash. If you want the actual property, there's a legal agreement that has to go with it. If you want to buy you know, the picture and not just the hash, you have to have an outside legal document that gives sovereignty to the hash that you've just purchased. And luckily, we just built a data structure that is full of keys. And if there is something that keys are really good at, it's signing things. So we have a way of identifying humans we have a way of identifying content and we have a way of signing things. And by the way, these keys in here, they don't have to just be keys for this network. You can put any key you want in there. If you want to bridge this network with Ethereum or storage or Filecoin, you can express monetary transactions by linking them through the structure and putting them in a legal document. So we can literally take the legal document, which is a text document or a fancy text document like a PDF, and you can have 
two identity trees. The identities of these people that we believe socially fiat identity represents a real human being, just like identity in the real world that governments already recognize are socially believed to be people are capable of entering into contracts with one another by signing on the dotted line. We can do that with this data structure. And that contract can reference the hashes of the content that's being referred to in the contract. It can reference the hashes or the wallets of the monetary transaction that's going to move the money, like Ethereum or Bitcoin. So this ends up being a lot more than just a framework for social networks. This idea of fiat identity ends up being a way for sovereign states to incrementally adopt digital identities, where right now there is no clear path to do that. There are some governments that are experimenting with it, some are on Bitcoin, but those systems have their flaws. Digital identity under this structure looks a lot more like digital identity or real identity that they use in the real world. It, is, it more closely parallels real identity that governments already recognize. These contracts, it's a clear path to adopting it because we're starting with the documents that they already use. If they recognize DocuSign, there's no reason why they wouldn't recognize the system. And if they don't recognize the system, well, DocuSign might be in trouble. So what we set out today was to make an internet too that has humans, their content, and their devices addressable for the web in a way that allows us to express equity, some property law on that internet. And today's not just me up here rambling. A lot of this stuff exists. There are social networks that are already built on this, like Secure Scuttlebutt. There's work that needs to be done to make them support multiple devices. This data structure, I have a bunch of proof of concepts and technical demos that use it. We need to make it real. So if this is stuff that interests you, I would really like to bring you along for the ride. And I want to leave you with this quote from a French theologian whose name I'm not going to bother to try to pronounce. Um, These trees which he plants and under whose shade he shall never sit. He loves them for themselves and for the sake of his children and his children's children who are to sit beneath the shadow of their spreading boughs. We plant trees, the shade we will never sit under, and we do it for the next generation. So let's go plant some better trees, y'all. Thank you.